so great to be with you today. So great to be with all of you online as well. I want to say a big welcome to you and hello, especially to our online campus. Love you guys. And to our Phnom Penh campus in Cambodia. Um, we're so we're so just excited that we can still be a global church family, hey, <laughs> during this time. And a special hello also to our Nations Church Cork campus, my Irish family. I love you and I miss you and I'm so glad to be sharing the word with you today. And Maya Ree, <laughs> Maya Ree, it's been some time. <laughs> I went to Ireland, I came back, a global pandemic hit and I know some of you think that that sounds suspicious and that maybe that I was responsible and there's some correlation in that timing, but I assure you I was not responsible. It was just, um, just a, a, a fun coincidence. But I'm so excited to be able to be back sharing with you today. And, um, you know, as you know, oh, I should, I should let you guys go, hey? You guys are just going to play the whole way through some groovy tunes behind me. <laughs> that would be great. Everyone, would you please thank our worship team? How incredible was the worship today? So amazing, so amazing. Hey, I want to take a quick moment to honour um, our campus pastors, Pastor Rick and Beck Van Sant. Um, they are incredible. Would you please give them a hand? So great. Such a blessing to our house. Um, and I also want to take a moment to honour our senior pastors, Pastor Ken and Chrissy Lee. You know, Chrissy's preaching her heart out at Scarborough campus today. Um, but yeah, I don't know anyone else that I would want to be led by, especially in the times like this. And I just want to honour you for how you have led me over the last seven years and how you've led our church through this season. So just one more time, would you honour our senior pastors? You know, as, we, as you know, we're in a, a, a season of wholeness and I'm so excited about that because it's something that I'm very, very passionate about because I do know what it is to be saved and not be whole and the mess that you can end up in because of that, you know? So I know the value and the weight of it and I also know that it's impossible when you do walk that wholeness journey, it's impossible not to desire that for others. And today I come with a desire and a hunger to see that wholeness and that restoration awakened in your life as it has been for mine. So let's pray, shall we? Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, you are so welcome. Would you come into this place? Would you flood it with your presence? Would you fill every room of every person watching online? And as we place ourselves, Lord, under the authority of your word, I ask that you would search our hearts, that you would search our lives, Lord God, and that where things are not in alignment with your will and with your purpose and your plan, that you would bring transformation and restoration today. And we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Great. Turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hekaliah. In the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. Its gates have been burned with fire. Today I want to talk to you about ruins and remnants. Ruins and remnants. Now this scripture describes the state of Jerusalem in utter ruin. You know, and recently I've been reading through the books of Ezra and Nehemiah um, about the return of the Jews to Jerusalem after the exile in Babylon. And, you know, to give you a context, to give you a bit of a backstory, I guess, Jerusalem had been taken down by the Babylonians led by big bad Nebuchadnezzar, right? The city was absolutely destroyed. The Jews were deported and were living in exile where they actually remained for decades, you know? Cut off from their covenant land, a place that was actually so central to their relationship with God, you know, the place that God had promised to them and their ancestors. So not only were they displaced, but the very thing that had identified them as a people had been torn down and burnt to the ground. But after about 50 years, the, um, after the overthrow of Babylon by the Persians, God moves on the heart of the king of Persia. 
you know, Cyrus, and he gives the Jews permission and access to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the ruins. And we read that over the next couple of decades, a number of people, in fact, did return to rebuild the ruins of Jerusalem. And these people were called a remnant, a remnant. The dictionary definition of the word remnant is a part or a quantity that is left after the greater part has been used, removed, or destroyed, right? The Anchor Bible Dictionary describes it as what is left after, of a community after it undergoes a catastrophe. So biblically, a remnant refers to a people, a people. And we see that throughout the journey of the nation of Israel, through slavery and wilderness and exile, there was always a remnant of people through which God used to continue the legacy of his people and this promise. And these people were not void of the catastrophe and the ruin, but they were blessed despite their weakness and failures because even when they stuffed up, even when everything went wrong, even when everything was in ruin, they maintained faith and hope for the promise of restoration. You know, this group of people, this remnant, ultimately preserved the nation of Israel until the time that Jesus came. And in this particular account in Nehemiah 1, he's inquiring about the condition of the people and the condition of the place, Jerusalem. And now the answer about the place was pretty straightforward. It was a ruin (laughs) and it had been in that condition for some time. However, the answer that he gives his brother, um, that, that his brother gives him about the people, about the remnant is very interesting. He describes them as those that had survived and had returned to the land. So it's clear in that language that not everyone who had survived had chosen to return. The book of Ezra reports that 42,360 people availed themselves of the privilege to return when they were first given permission, along with a ridiculous amount of donkeys, mind you. It's like 6,000 donkeys, I'm like, who needs that many donkeys? Right? And smaller groups followed in later stages of this restoration work. Right? And this restoration work had actually been spoken about multiple times by multiple prophets to these people. Jeremiah 33 says this, I will bring Judah and Israel back from captivity and will rebuild them as they were before. I will cleanse them from all their sin they have committed against me and will forgive all their sins of rebellion against me. Then this city will bring me renown, joy, praise, and honor before all nations on the earth that hear of all the good things that I do for it. And they will be in awe and will tremble at the abundant prosperity and peace I provide for it. Isaiah 58, 12 says, your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets and dwellings. You know, they were prophesying about the remnant and the restoration work, right? See, God's desire and intention was always to see a people return to the land and rebuild these ruins, that a restoration work would take place, to see them become a testimony of his goodness. And he had made that no secret. He'd made it no secret. However, though many survived the exile, only a portion Only a remnant, only a part of the whole actually returned to the land to see restoration take place. All of them had heard the same promises. All of them had been given permission, but only few returned. So there was those that had been saved, but were not pursuing restoration. Isn't that interesting? If they'd all been given access to this restoration... If they'd all been given permission, then why didn't some go? And I asked myself the question, what would I do? What would I do? What would you do? What would you do online? <laughs> you know? What, 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 what? I mean, right now, let's face it, we've all been in some level of captivity <laughs> for some time now. And I tell you what, if those borders were open, if we were given permission to leave, I would be on the first plane out. Yeah. Any, any amens out there, right? Yes, I can see a lot of hands, right? Right? 
You know, that's, 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 that's the fact of it. But seriously, in this situation, what would you do and what have you done? What have you done in times, in situations where, where the world around you has broken you, defeated you, burned you? Times when it felt like your life was in utter ruin. Times when it looked like the promises of God for your life were utterly destroyed. What have you done? Because when I look at this account, I see some things which make me understand why some people didn't step into the restoration and wholeness available and why you and I might not either. In Jeremiah 51, 34, we see these words reflect the viewpoint of the exiled Jews. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has devoured us. He has thrown us into confusion. He has made us an empty jar. Like a serpent, he has swallowed us, filled his stomach with our delicacies and spewed us out. Graphic language. May the violence done to our flesh be on Babylon, say the inhabitants of Zion. May our blood be on those who live in Babylonia, said Jerusalem. What is very clear here is that there was a legitimate reason for the ruin. Right? But it also tells them, tells us that what had happened to these people had consumed them. Had some, and we all have a legitimate reason for our ruin, right? But that reason can often consume us. You know, Babylon has devoured us, thrown us into confusion, emptied us, swallowed us. Not only does this paint a picture of the complete destruction of Israel, but it uses the language of consumption of being ingested and absorbed, you know, which is really interesting because that also reflects what other prophetic scripture and historical studies have indicated, that many of the exiles finding themselves in comfortable, even prosperous circumstances over time, simply assimilated into Babylonian life. You know, they adopted Babylonian traditions and lifestyles. Some people simply became like Babylon. Right? They assimilated into their surroundings. They were absorbed by it. They had spent so long living in the aftermath of what had happened to them, um, living captive to a nation that had broken them down, that their identity as a nation had become confused. You know, their identity as a people of God essentially was devoured by their surroundings. You know, this was their life now. The promises of God hadn't worked out, but they had managed to survive and make a new life in Babylon. So it's no surprise that by the time that they were given permission to go back and return, they didn't want to take the four-month journey to go back to face that kind of destruction, the painful memories, and go through this messy, difficult process of rebuilding. And isn't it true that we can also assimilate into our Babylon? When something's gone wrong, you've stuffed up, maybe something stuffed you up, and you've just accepted life as it is now. Have you maybe lost sight of your identity and of your purpose and embraced ways of the world around you, ways that, of life that were once completely foreign to you because of the disillusionment that comes with pain and hurt and disappointment? We think, well, I might as well stay here. You know, we might as well embrace life as it is now. Because life as it was before, that's now been destroyed. That's been devoured. That's too far gone. If we can't have the promises of God, well, we might as well make the most of it. You know, it's worth pointing out that the language of I might as well is a language of yielding. It's a language of surrendering. And it's a language steeped in defeat. And when we assimilate into our Babylon, when we allow it to consume us, to consume who we once were and who we were called to be is an acceptance of defeat. And of course, people naturally blamed Babylon, didn't they? And isn't it true that many of us blame our Babylon? You know, although these people, they managed to to function and live their life in exile, many of the people still felt like victims. You know, and we can hear that in this scripture. We can hear that in their complaint, calling on God to punish Babylon for what they had done. And rightly so. <laughs> I think we can all relate to this way of thinking. Even though they had survived all of their problems, all of their pain was because they were victims of what someone else had done to them. And I can completely understand it appearing that way. 
You know, a few years ago, um, I had pain in my ribs, pain and swelling, um, and I had it for weeks, and as usual, I ignored it until it became a bigger issue. <laughs> um, but I went to the doctor, I got a scan done. A few hours after the scan, I get a phone call asking me to come back to the surgery immediately. So I go in and the doctor says, sit, Kristen, sit down, we think we know what is causing your pain. And he says, have you been stabbed recently? <laughs> and I, I kind of did what you do, I kind of like laughed nervously, I thought I'd misheard, I asked for clarification, he said it once again, very clearly, have you been stabbed recently? And <laughs> I paused again, kind of waiting for some kind of punchline that never came, and instead he brought more clarification, he said, with a knife and did the action. <laughs> and then as I realised that he was actually waiting for an answer, I, I said to him, you know what? I've been pretty busy. <laughs> However, I think that I would remember some kind of event like that, you know, or being in, involved in some kind of bar fight or gang warfare, but that's really not who I am as a person. Anyway, he t eventually tells me the reason for this ridiculous line of questioning was the fact that there was, in fact, a metal piece of shrapnel lodged in my ribs and that it would need to come out because it was clearly the cause of my pain. And so, um, but luckily, well, <laughs> he sends me off to a surgeon who happened to be on vacation and because I was in copious amounts of pain, I decided um, I would go back to my, my usual doctor and get another referral to a different surgeon so I could have this dealt with. And when I went to this, my own doctor, he, he looked at the scan and did his own investigation and he realised that the cause of my pain was actually not coming from this piece of metal shrapnel. It was actually coming from the cartilage that I'd torn during a recent bout of pneumonia and because I hadn't dealt with it, <laughs> um, I hadn't allowed it to heal, it just caused more damage and perpetuated my pain. And for those wondering... <laughs> We actually do not know what the piece of metal is or how it got there. I'm sorry that I can't give you closure today. Or I don't have closure. It's a mystery and a story for another sermon another day, right? Um, first question I ask when I get to heaven. <laughs> um, anyway, so um, I asked the doctor. I asked the doctor why the other doctor and the radiologist would have concluded that this metal was the issue. And he replied something very interesting. He said, well, obviously, they've just seen the metal and jumped to the conclusion that that's what was causing your current pain. I mean, it's a lot easier to blame a foreign object, isn't it? And that is very true. It was so easy for the Jews to blame the foreigners, to blame Babylon. Babylon, after all, was the most obvious and visible cause of harm. It was the foreign object that had come in and left its mark. Of course they would want that to be dealt with, just like I wanted that shrapnel pulled out of my side when I was convinced it was the cause of my pain. But the fact was that although something clearly had happened in the past, whatever that was, it wasn't responsible for my current condition. And Babylon may have broken Jerusalem down in the first place, but Babylon wasn't responsible for its current condition. It wasn't responsible for it staying that way because once they were given access and permission to go back, once they were no longer held captive, the state of their broken city was their responsibility. And isn't it so much easier in our pain to point to the things, to point to the people outside of ourselves to justify our condition? You know, consumed with anger and unforgiveness and bitterness and rage, we look at that damaging relationship, we look at that loss, we look at that disappointment and we get so caught up in blaming those things that we never deal with the brokenness that we're left with. Please hear my heart. I am not diminishing your experience, right? I'm not diminishing what someone else has done to you. I'm not diminishing what has happened to you in the past. Those are very real experiences and traumas. And hear me, I have been a victim of abuse and control. I would be the last person to diminish your pain. 
and to deny it. But what I am saying is just like blaming Babylon won't rebuild Jerusalem. Just like pulling that foreign object from my side wouldn't have alleviated my current pain. Blaming what the world has done to you isn't going to fix your brokenness or rebuild your God-given identity. You can be certain that God will be faithful to deal with your Babylon, but you need to be willing for him to also deal with your brokenness. As part of that is acknowledging that your condition, your brokenness, your lack of wholeness isn't necessarily your fault, but it is your responsibility. Restoration doesn't come when we blame our Babylon. It doesn't come when we accept our Babylon or become like our Babylon. It only leaves us in ruins. It makes a temporary experience permanent. Those who chose never to return never got to see those walls raised up again. They never got to see the gates that had been burned by fire restored and in working order. They never got to see this new temple that would actually be even more glorious than the first because it would be the place that the Messiah, Jesus, entered into. Those who chose not to return remained survivors, but they never became the overcomers that God destined them to be. God's desire was not for you to live in your ruins. God's desire was that there would be a remnant, that there would be a people that would pursue the restoration that he promised. And this particular remnant that chose to return to Jerusalem, they had too been captives of Babylon. They too had a legitimate reason for their brokenness. They too had found a way to function in their pain. But Jerusalem was a symbol of their identity. And as long as it remained in ruin, it was a testament to their shame. It was a testament to their weakness. It identified them as a defeated people. Others could scoff and point to it as evidence of the weakness of Israel's God. Even though his desire was that through a restorative work, a work of restoration that this city would actually once again bring him renown and glory and honour. And this remnant realised right now those ruins, they testify to what Babylon did to us. They testify to our defeat, but they don't have to stay that way because we've been given a promise and we've been given permission. We've received access. God has made a way. They had a decision to make whether they would be defined by their current condition or by their covenant with God, right? And upon their faith, upon their partnership with God to take responsibility for their own brokenness, the ruins were restored. And this work of restoration actually coincided um, coincided with a spiritual revival in the people. It says in the book of Nehemiah that it was obvious to those around them and their enemies that this work had been done with the help of their God, right? Because the ruin testifies to the past, but the remnant testifies to the promise of God. The ruin testifies to the promise of God. Ruins are guaranteed. They're guaranteed for all of us, but it is our choice if we will remain a ruin or if we would become a remnant that God can raise up as a testimony to Him because the truth is that just like God made a way for them to be restored, He made a way for us. Catch this, Ezekiel 36, verse 33. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. On the day... I cleanse you from all your sins. I will resettle your towns and re- the ruins will be rebuilt. The desolate land will be cultivated instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass through it. They will say, this land that was laid waste has become like the Garden of Eden. The cities that were lying in ruins, desolate and destroyed, are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nations around you will re- that remain will know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt what was destroyed and have replanted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken and I will do it. Listen to that language of restoration, right? This wasteland becoming like the Garden of Eden. See, God's long game was always to see his people living the life that he originally intended at the beginning, right? And as scripture speaks, this scripture speaks of a day that restoration would be made possible. And it says, on the day that I cleanse you from your sin. 
right? It is pointing to the cross. On the day that I cleanse you from your sin, the blood poured out to cleanse us from our sin. It is pointing to the cross as our access point to restoration. The cross wasn't just about cleansing us from our sin, paying a debt on behalf of our behalf for our wrongdoing. It was about giving you access once again to what he paid the price for you to have, right? God's desire in cleansing us from our sin was not that we would just be saved, but that we would be made whole, that we would be restored. We wouldn't just have life, but we would have life to the full, that a full work of restoration might be done in us, it might be done through us, that what was once lying in ruin, desolate and destroyed would be fortified and strengthened and lived in again and that your life would testify to those around you not of your ruin but of his mighty power to restore the work of restoration was done on the cross of Christ we have access the borders are open the restrictions are off he made a way to restore what the enemy came to steal and kill and destroy but just as many Just as many people survived the exile, but not all of them chose to step into restoration. Many of us accept the gift of salvation, but we never step into wholeness. Some of us are too busy blaming our Babylon or living like them. Some of us are still living as if restoration wasn't available. And we are shortchanging ourselves of what Christ paid for us to have. Your life can be a ruin that keeps testifying of the things that have broken you down or of Christ who came to restore you. Restoration is our choice, but it's God's doing. You know, immediately after Ezekiel 36, this conversation about God's heart for restoration continues in Ezekiel 37. You know the one. You know the story in a vision. The Lord takes Ezekiel to a valley full of dry bones. Bones that had been there for a long time. Bones of armies that had succumbed to their enemies, that had been defeated and scattering an enemy's bones, leaving them uncovered, unburied, exposed. It was pretty common back then. It was like adding insult to injury. Right, the bones were left there to testify, if you will, of their defeat. And the Lord likens these bones to the people of Israel. And Ezekiel asks him this question. He asks Ezekiel this question. He says to him, Can these bones live? Now, in my mind, Ezekiel. He could have been forgiven for basically saying, what a stupid question, Lord. (laughs) Of course they can't live. But he clearly didn't respond out of what he could see because he said, Lord, only you know. Only you know. He must have understood that what he could see in front of him clearly wasn't what the Lord could see for him to ask such a question. And although he couldn't see it himself, although all he could see was dry bones, he chose to partner with the Word of the Lord. And he began to prophesy as commanded. He prophesied for the bones to come together. He prophesied for the muscles and the tendons to form and for the skin to cover them, for breath to enter them. And he saw a restoration work appear before his eyes an army filled with the Spirit of the living God. He didn't know what those bones would become, but he partnered with God. He partnered with the Word of the Lord step by step and bit by bit until they were fully restored and fully alive. And this is what our journey to wholeness and restoration looks like. See, when you look at the ruins of your life, you and God, you need to understand you see completely different things. Where you see a ruin... He sees a remnant he can work with. When you see total destruction and death, he sees a restoration work. When you see a bunch of dried up bones, he sees a people alive with the Spirit of God. He's not looking for you to have big vision. He's not looking for you to know or to understand what that might become. But he's simply asking you, 
to look upon that ruin and say, Lord, only you know. Only you know what you can do with these. Only you know what can become of these. And to partner with him to see a work of restoration come to life. You know, about 11 years ago, I walked away from God. I walked away from the promises that he had for my life. It was due to my own lack of wholeness and the brokenness of others, like a massive combination punch. And I found myself in exile. I'd been hurt by the church, cut off, and my life seemed to be in ruins. And like many people I've been talking about today, I still very much believed in God, but I also believed that I was damaged goods. I was too far gone to ever see the promises of God come to pass. And I found myself embracing Babylon. You know, I embraced a life of the world around me, a life that I once considered completely foreign. You know, I was the adulterous woman, the demon-possessed man, the lost son. I was all of that rolled into one. I squandered all I had left on a lifestyle that I never considered that I would live. And it wasn't a conscious decision, but feeling cut off, feeling defeated, feeling exiled, feeling isolated, I simply became immersed in my defeat. I was devoured by it. And then it became a case of, well, I might as well. I might as well. Because by the time it got to this stage, in my eyes, the journey was way too far back. The ruin was far beyond repair. I was too hurt, too abused, too broken, too damaged and I accepted defeat. And you better believe that I blamed everyone else for my condition. I pointed to all the external things, all the people had come in who had broken me, who had stole from me, who had abused me, who had left something behind in me. Did I have a Babylon that had broken me down, left me in ruin? 100%. Did I also make decisions that kept me that way? Absolutely. I was simply perpetuating my ruin. I was making something that could have been temporary, permanent. And I got to the point where I realized that it didn't matter what started it. I was broken. I needed restoration. And see, for many years of my life, I'd heard these promises. I'd heard these prophecies over my life about how God wanted to use me. And I got to the point in my ruin where I I asked myself the question. I began to wonder, what would happen if I went back? What would happen if I returned? Could He still use me? Could these bones live? And seven years ago, this month actually, Seven years ago, I walked back into the house of God. I was actually shaking because I was so terrified. The trauma of the past was so great. My shame of my brokenness was so immense. But then Pastor Ken got up and he spoke a word about rebuilding the ruins. And it was as if God was reminding me that ruins can be rebuilt. And I chose that day, and I've chosen every day after, that though my life be a ruin, that I would choose to be a remnant of faith. I would choose to come back to my walls. I would choose to come back to my desecrated place of worship when all I had was the same ancient promise to restore and rebuild. And I simply came with a remnant of faith. I simply came with the little that I had left standing. All I had looked like stones and bones to me. And I could not imagine, I couldn't see what that might become. But over the last seven years, brick by brick, stone by stone, 
bone by bone in the face of opposition, I've watched what God has built upon the remnant of my faith and the remnants of my life. And my life today no longer testifies to my shame or to my weakness. It no longer testifies to what broke it down. It testifies to the one that raised it back up, the great Redeemer, my great Restorer. I need you to understand today that I didn't come to preach today. I came to testify that Babylon may have broken you down, but we've been given access. We've been given permission and access to a restorative work done on the cross of Christ. And you might think that your ruins are too far gone. You might think that that they're, they're, they're too destroyed, but He's looking for a remnant of faith. He's looking for a remnant that will say, only you know, Lord, only you know. You may see rubble and stones and dried up bones, but He's gonna raise them up. He's gonna raise them up just like He raised His own body from the grave. If you would just choose to be a remnant, rather than remain a ruin. Because everyone has a ruin, but not everyone becomes a remnant. Restoration, it's our choice, but it's God's doing. And God is looking for a remnant of faith on the earth today. He already came for the ruin. He's coming back for the remnant. He's coming back for a church who will hold to the promise of restoration. And there needs to be a restorative work done in us. There needs to be a revival in His people before the world will look and see the glory of God in it. Amen. Why don't you stand to your feet? You know, before we move on, really believe that God wants to do some stuff today and deal with some stuff. But I am very aware that there might be people either in this room or perhaps you're watching online today and you might feel like your life is a ruin. And I wanna tell you today that there's no life that is beyond His restoration. There is no life that He can't restore and rebuild. But maybe Jesus has never been part of your life. Maybe that's never been a reality for you. You know, what I've been talking about today is actually a great picture of the Gospel of Christ. We were all in exile. We were all separated from God, separated from His promise and His purpose for our life because of our sin and our brokenness. But He made a way. He made a way for the, through the cross of Christ for us to come back to God. And by laying His life down and cleansing us from our sin and from our past, He gave us access to wholeness. He gave us access to be restored and made whole. And the Bible says that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that you will be saved. What does that mean? It means that you will no longer be separated from Him in this life or the next life. And so today, I wanna give you that opportunity to invite Jesus into your life if that has never been a reality for you. And with every eye closed, every head bowed, I'm simply going to pray a prayer. And you would just repeat this after me and maybe you're praying this for the first time. Or maybe like me, you'd walked away from God and you wanna come back to Him today. All you need to do is line by line, repeat this prayer after me and we're all gonna pray together online. You can pray this prayer where you are. Come on church, let's pray. Lord Jesus, I come to you today just as I am. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I ask your forgiveness for all my wrongs. And I accept the free gift of your love and your mercy. Jesus, I ask you to be my saviour. 
I ask you to be Lord of my life. I believe that you rose again to give me a hope and a future. And I pray that you would lead me and guide me into it. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 So good. Hey, if you made that decision, if you prayed this prayer for the first time or the first time in a long time online, I want to send you to our website. Please don't do this journey alone. If you go to nationschurch.com forward slash my decision, you can get some online resources there. One of our pastors will be in touch with you during the week. It's probably going to be me. (laughs) And um, we would love to journey with you in this amazing decision that you've just made.